Welcome into another episode of Everything is Logistics, a podcast for the thinkers in freight. We are proudly presented by SPI Logistics. I am your host, Blythe Brumleaf, and we've got Grace Sharkey back in the virtual studio, I guess. Yeah, virtual digital studio, whatever. Um, but Grace Sharkey, Freightways fame, um, she does like 7 million shows. Um, so she's here doing another one. This is a monthly appearance uh, that she does. And uh, we call it affectionately called Freight Friends, where we dive into a bunch of different topics, usually one to two main topics. And then uh, we typically have like a favorite, but fun, um, sometimes fun, uh, conspiracy <laughs> theories. Uh, and then also our favorite logistics of stories. So everybody really liked that logistics of sand stories i even got like a little um copyright notice from youtube on it but the yeah. creator didn't care <laughs> beyonce's been doing this uh, that to me recently on instagram too like taking my 2016 posts down and stuff dang dang it's probably just like a legal team going in and, and cleaning stuff up exactly Rude. <laughs> not for free no 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 not on instagram <laughs> not today What's new with you, Grace? How, how you, you, you're, are you feeling refreshed now after Future of Supply Chain Freight Waves Conference just happened in Cleveland? You guys did a lot of cool stuff up there. G give us a little recap. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know what's so interesting is I, until I end up getting to this event every year, we, we've had it in Arkansas in the past. We had it in Cleveland this past year. The Future of Supply Chain is a really interesting event for almost more of the economic updates, right? Like less of... This is what tech is doing today. I think that's definitely part of the conversation, but it's almost more of like, here's how tech can help you throughout this economic turmoil that we're going through. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. We got to see a number of speakers who were clearly very involved with the economy and had an idea of what's coming next and what we should be watching for with freight volumes. I mean, unfortunately, there's no crazy... Uh, spontaneous positive news that came out of it, right? And just, oh, uh, a ton of ships for some reason that week, like loaded up from China and headed their way over here. Nothing crazy like that happened. But uh, I, I think it's just interesting to kind of hear from multiple people. And, and, and also, too, it's a chance to talk to a lot of the providers in this space and, and what they're hearing from their customers. And I will say, it sounds like most, especially on the trucking side, brokerages as well, most are realizing like this is, this market could get a tad bit worse. Uh, right now, it's definitely higher rates that we've seen so far in July than we've seen in, in May and June. But I, I doubt that we're going to see this market fall below like $2 or something mm -hmm. like that. You know what I mean? So I think people are having or know what their worst case scenario can be and are now planning their budgets around it, at least from what I'm hearing from a lot of tech providers who are out there saying, listen, we're finally starting to get calls back. People are starting to not, maybe not optimistic, but understanding, okay, there's a time, there's a place for an investment during these types of times, mm -hmm. right? And, and I don't know if you you know the answer to this, but I was thinking of it as you were talking. What is, I guess, the, the dollar amount that carriers should be charging, I guess, in order to just either break even or to make enough to survive? You mentioned $2, uh, $2 a mile. Is that number like 250 or $3? Is there any kind of, I guess, maybe insight there? Uh, well... I will say from the trucking experts that I talked to, there is no true number. I mean, it all depends right on what year. Uh, do you have new equipment and your cost uh, for that truck are higher than most? Are you uh, running more long distance? So you have to also consider where the driver's sleeping mm -hmm. and food. and So uh, there's not really a great judgment number, but to kind of showcase to you uh, from the past market, uh, when we hit the really low, low in May, uh, that, and I, I would say that was probably our biggest bottom for so far this year, that hit around $2.12. Hmm. Uh, and that was about a week and a half before Memorial Day as well. So um, it wasn't like, uh, I think we saw it ramp up for like the end of the month too. So it didn't stay at that rate for long. Right now we're about $2.32. This is our our NTI, our National Truckload Index. So it gives you the average spot rate across the domestic U.S. Uh, so if you're if you're running contract, you're probably seeing about, I want to say our spread difference is about 60, 70 cents. So you're seeing mm -hmm. a little bit more on the contract side of things. 
Uh, but as the contract starts, contract uh, shipments start to run out, then you'll see that the, can, the two numbers contract closer to each other mm. as well. So uh, I will say uh, 232 is pretty great. It's actually, we have a forecasting model as well, and it, it has forecasted pretty well throughout this uh, season. But I could I could see this falling back down to that low two two ten ish area uh, in the fall, right around I would say probably around October ish, November like right in time for F three. But uh, <laughs> I could see it falling as student loans start to come back on and people start making that transition into those payments as well. Yeah, because that's all obviously going to impact spending, where a lot of spending is going towards services right now, not necessarily products. So it'll be really interesting to see how the retailers are, are preparing for the perceived, I guess, holiday shopping season. Exactly. And it depends, of course, like, uh, you know, what we're buying for, too. Like, I think I still see some a lot of people taking trips. I mean, if we get into the holiday season and people are saying, hey, Instead of uh, buying individual gifts, let's take a trip next year or, or do some. Uh, we might not see it in the numbers that we want to. So, and plus, you got to think about. It. I know you were worked in the space, right? Like then you go into January, and January is always the slowest month for freight. Mm -hmm. So, even if there's a little bit of a pick me up, there's going to be a slide back down as well. So it's just put your put your expectations on and yeah. or up or low or yeah, keep your expectations low and and yeah, hopefully exactly. you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, as as we are, so sort of give a, you know, sort of a roadmap for today's show, because this actually ties in the future of supply chain conference actually really ties in with our first topic. We're going to be talking about the fast fashion supply chain. Then we're going to get into a little bit of the best business models in freight. And then uh, we're going to, I mean, we can't have a show without dunking on Meghan Markle. I think this is kind of yeah. like a regular thing. It probably should be. Um, uh, I think we have talked about her in every single episode we've recorded together. So we're just going to keep it going. Stop dropping hot gossip about her every <laughs> month. That's really their fault. <laughs> I mean, and, it, and then you have to wonder, like, is it her team that's doing it? Or is it just her embarrassing failures? Or is it a uh, psyop <laughs> against her? The or read. is it a combination <laughs> Is it just more an embarrassment to society, Megan? <laughs> is it karma finally coming back to you? I know I love what a So it read. could be a combination of all those things. <laughs> And then we'll wrap up with uh, our favorite conspiracy theories at the moment. And then, of course, our logistics story, as mentioned earlier in the show. You guys really liked that logistics of sand story that we did in the last episode. So we're going to bring you a couple new ones today. And mine's kind of related, uh, a little bit of a cargo crime. I'm a little obsessed with it. So we'll get into those later on. First topic, though, fast fashion in the supply chain, because... There are a lot of Shein influencers right now that are in a lot of shit and sort of, uh, I guess, you know, it's a, the, the too long didn't read, the too long didn't watch. This is making big waves and sort of like the, the fashion beauty landscape because a bunch of influencers were invited to visit a factory in, um, I, I, I think it was in Denver um, or around the Colorado area, or they were flown to China. One of the two, I couldn't really um, grasp where they actually did the factory tour. I would be surprised if they did a factory tour in the United States because I didn't know that she had any factories in the United States. Um, yeah. So they anyways, they took this trip. It was um, Shein. A little bit of backstory has um, they have some rumblings about their supply chain uh, morals. Uh, they use um, <laughs> low cost labor to, to put it uh, mildly. Um, they have factories staged all over the world where they can take advantage of low cost labor. And uh, that is the reason why you can get uh, very, very cheaply made clothes very pretty fast and uh, very cheap. We're talking like anywhere from like eight to ten dollars for a shirt that you'll see on a lot of different e-com shops, Amazon shops that will those shops will list it for around 30 bucks. Um, so it just kind of, you know, I guess it shines a light on their supplier system and where they're getting a lot of these clothing. So the influencers went there. They looked at a lot of their different operations within a warehouse um, and <clears throat> because of that uh, a lot of folks have come out and started commenting and targeting these influencers because they didn't know about or maybe they didn't know about you know some of their shady manufacturing policies um, they just got a tour of a warehouse and got some behind the scenes footage and now they're they're being blamed for um, Shein's 
I guess, supply chain. So um, with all that said, uh, Grace, I know you've done, you know, plenty of work on these types of stories. So so what is your early read on on this one? Uh, I will say they they did and they did fly them to China. So they did go to Ooh, China. Okay, on this okay. Trip. I and I will say I have like, uh, I have mixed feelings because I've attempted this this same flight myself. Uh, there's a, a big company out in China called JD.com. Hmm. And I've tried the they're like the Amazon of China. They've got like all robotics, like uh, warehouses and stuff like that. And I have tried so hard to get close to their marketing team. And I'm like, and they're, they did kind of the same thing uh, years ago. And so I was like, if you're ever doing this again, like put me on the list. <laughs> Just because I, I think I've never been to China. I think I would love it. And yeah. uh, uh, hopefully I would be blind to whatever atrocities that are happening behind the scenes. Uh, also, I will say I, I, I bought from the, the site once or twice and i've never been fully thrilled by the quality so mm -hmm. at first i was like okay interested in seeing like maybe how i've done deep dives on their uh, technology though they have a, a ton of investment that they've done uh in the past uh in particular that uh is, is pretty interesting uh and a Are lot of algorithms it really sophisticated Yes. Yeah. I mean, they, they're uh, deep into buy now, pay later systems. Their mm -hmm. reverse logistics uh, is, is pretty huge. They work with a company called Narvar that has over 200,000 uh, drop off locations. Uh, they have, uh, they put a lot of money into the influencer side of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, gaining that loyalty and retention, really gamifying rewards for customers uh, and, for, and for those influencers. Um, they, I know of big areas, uh, traceability, visibility tools. I think that's a lot of people will say, right, if I do buy from them, uh, it usually gets to me pretty quickly and it usually is, they're pretty open to the delivery times and things of that nature. Uh, so it is, it's pretty interesting as a whole, I think where they're investing in making sure that they're competing really well with more of these, uh, U S, uh, operations now, uh, how are they getting things done so fast and so cheap? Uh, probably not great labor practices, which is why everyone is really fighting against them. Uh, and when I say everyone, I mean our elected representatives. So I guess uh, she and girls, if you're out there and you're or guys and you want to fight against it, reach out to your uh, rep your your representatives and let them know to stop it. But uh, yeah, because they're, no, they're trying to block the IP. I, I, she and is trying to IPO in the United States, but they're blocking it. I think. Yeah, well, I think they put it on pause just because of the uproar from representatives, um, knowing that the fights there. Right, whatever you want to go public you want to make it as smooth as possible aka pay less lawyers as much as possible so uh, i think that's part of the reason they're holding off for now but uh, uh yeah a lot of representatives aren't happy that and it makes sense i mean they are a, a powerful being they're uh anti-competitive and the fact that you're using labor that no one else here is allowed to use so um yeah i, I guess i i wasn't surprised though that they brought in influencers it's a it's a pretty smart attempt to try to cover yourselves up. But I think what um, happened, right, is that backlash on the influencer themselves, knowing whether or not you saw any of it, knowing, okay, well, how's how, no one there asked the tough question of, but you're also in China. Who's trying to ask tough questions? That's it's like who's who gets this trip to China? It's like okay, now that we're here, and you know, right? I'm, I'm vulnerable. Everyone wants to pretend as if they're an investigative journalist, and yeah. it's it, it, no, it, it is nobody does it more than like the keyboard warriors who see. And I think that there's kind of like a few things going on. I think that there's a little bit of jealousy going on from the commenters seeing yeah. somebody get advantage get. Um, get get the advantages of you know getting flown out um yep. going on these you know behind the scenes type tours um and and 
you know, not having access to those sort of same opportunities. And then also, you know, there's, you know, the geopolitical like struggles between the US and, and China is that's another kind of play involved as well. And then there's, you know, the the folks who are really passionate about the environment. So it's like all of these things that are coming together, or and obviously labor laws as well, and you know, ethical sourcing, which is just, uh, it's kind of like exhausting at times. So I don't blame like these in it because from like a greater point, I, there's a lot of responsibility that's put on the consumer to know these yeah. things, to yep. know the entire supply chain of these big conglomerates when sometimes you just need a dress in a few days. You just need something cheap in a few Literally, days. Yes. So are you, yeah. you know, some days I'm not going to have my, you know, morality standards, you know, eyes wide open on every single thing that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I just think that they're, they got a little, I think the overwhelming majority of these influencers got too much heat when yeah. that heat should be directed towards the company because mm -hmm. it's something like a hot and like close to, or 71 companies are like the top 100 companies are responsible for 71% of emissions since like the 1980s. Yeah. And it's these big corporations, it's in their best interest to put the onus on the consumer. And so if they make it challenging to find out the, I guess, the morality and the ethical nature of the supply chain, if they put that on the consumer, then they can kind of wash their hands of it. And that's what's happening right now with these influencers because Shein is not coming in to help and defend them. It's yeah everyone they're they're getting blocked like they're are not getting blocked but um a lot of these influencers have turned their comments off they've they've deleted the posts um there's one girl in particular which i should probably play the clip now um she seems to be the one that is getting a lot of the uh, i guess uh, ire of folks is being directed towards her but she apparently i haven't seen the videos um some of them were taken down she deleted them because she was trying to like double down on her message of like i met with them behind closed doors in denver and i think that's where denver comes from um so she met with she and people in denver to kind of talk about some of those ethical issues and she said that she was comfortable with their answers and so she created a bunch of comment or content defending um she and so i think that um that's why that she's getting a little bit of this heat yeah and so um let me well, see you, if I you know what's interesting too is like you're exactly right like as much as our generation wants to say like hey we stand for right these like esg initiatives and sustainable practices they're valued at over a hundred billion dollars i think it's the average person has bought 14 items every year from them oh wow uh, and 28 percent of u.s fashion sales is going to them as well so wow yeah it's huge so at some point it's like I say this to people too on anything political, like, you know, what doesn't change things yelling at people on social media, like take that same energy, write a letter to your representative, go visit them. Right. As you are going to fly to China, go, go visit your representative down the street. Who's in an office that's completely approachable and, and let them know, like, that's how you feel. But like, yeah, bullying a bunch of influencers on TikTok. Which, if we want to go down that <laughs> rabbit hole, is owned by the Chinese. <laughs> They're being bullied on Instagram, too. <laughs> China's like, win, win, win. <laughs> ching, ching, ching. Like, yeah, ching, ching, ching. <laughs> which is, God, Quite that's not, probably not the right phrase to use this, but I mean, yeah. like, money-wise. <laughs> Quite literally, they're like, oh, yes. Oh, yes, go, go make content on TikTok and yell at each other there. That's not good for us either. And tweet it from your iPhones and yeah. text it from your iPhones that are also, you know, it, it, I mean, how how deep are we going to go with this like ethical supply chain? Because um, right? I would I would be willing to bet that the overwhelming majority of those I would willing to bet all of them that all of those comments that were made in a negative fashion were coming from a phone that has natural resources that were sourced using a lot of the same corrupt labor practices. Um, yep. So that's I guess that's not an excuse. But it is something that, you know, from like a fast fashion standpoint, it is becoming, I think, more just aware uh, with our generation, but also with younger generations. I think that's why we're seeing, you know, a lot of the increases in like vintage fashion and vintage finds. And I, I don't, you know, anecdotally here in Jacksonville, 
there are a handful of shops that have popped up all over um, Jacksonville, specializing in like, you know, vintage sports gear um, from like Florida based teams or just really anywhere, you know, people getting rid of their old stuff and they're going to thrift stores and they're finding them and they're sourcing them themselves and then selling it in their retail shops. So it's shops specifically designed to, to, is it rethread or not rethread, but yeah, I guess up up skill up up sale. I don't know what that that phrase is called, but it's it's basically just making sure that your the clothes that you're buying um, has a certain shelf life where you can reuse them multiple times, multiple um, you know decades versus like the Shein clothes, which you know may fall apart after a couple of days. There was one shirt I bought from Shein, and this was totally my fault. But I tried to put an iron on it, and it melted right to the iron. Um, so it wasn't. Yeah. It, it's not the best made stuff either. But no. but let me play this clip really quick because this is the the chick I was talking about um, that is uh, she's facing the most because she's doubled down. She has since gone and deleted a lot of those. Um, but this is her sort of explaining. Um, hopefully we can hear the sound. Please, God, let us hear the sound. Feel like a show. It didn't feel like something was quickly put together. Influencer Danny Carbonari is speaking out against growing criticism after posting glowing reviews of Shan's operations in China. In an almost 12 minute video, the influencer begins by saying she is imperfect and can take accountability for her actions. She describes being interested in the brand over their size, inclusivity, and affordability, and said she's friends with someone who worked there who helped make further introductions. She explains the company took her on a brand trip to Tahoe where she says she brought up many concerns and questions to the higher ups. Later, she said she had an off the record meeting with political people and journalists where higher ups addressed more questions and gave answers. To me, I was, I'm a very like logistic person and um, they just gave so many numbers and like that's when I learned about like their auditing system and how they do have so many suppliers. She explains that the China trip was organized because the company <laughs> wanted to put an end to criticism. We're aware of all these rumors and all of this stuff that's going on and we want to put an end to it. The trip, we were not paid for the trip, we were not paid to post, um, our travel accommodations were taken care of. But ultimately Danny still says she needs to do better adding that the experience has caused her to reevaluate her brand and herself. I should have done more research. And I think content creators in general, we don't do enough research. And I think especially plus size content creators, we're just so happy to be included. I'm, you know, sorry and sad that a lot of people that don't know me, um, you know, are so, so angry and upset. But the best thing that I can do moving forward is to lead with the same intention and authenticity. I always have an add in doing the research, um, doing my part. So, thoughts. <laughs> I'm like a logistics person, okay? <laughs> I but... know. That's why I wanted to play that clip, because she <laughs> said that line. I was like, we have to play this, because she's trying to bring the, um... the logistics girlies into her drama, and we're not going to stand all, for it. logistics girlies, I want you. <laughs> Love. Like, what audience is she talking to? Our audience? How dare she? Uh, She's starting to creep in. They they found out. I also love that they actually like forced her into labor too. How Chinese of them. Uh, it's so awesome. Like, she's at one point literally packing boxes. They're like this is perfect. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting because like they could have... I w knowing uh, not knowing China, like China and our best friends, but knowing China's antics, like there's always other like that could have been like a warehouse. I would be surprised if that's like a upfront warehouse that they take clients to. Oh, and, for sure. You know what I mean, I, d I doubt that's where it's all happening. I mean, for the amount of clothing and stuff in that, like, no, there's no way that's where that's all happening. Um, I just hate, I will say I hate apology videos. Just like do it and move on. Like I, it's, I, I don't know why people spend this time like, oh my God, I made a mistake. Like, no, you got a free trip to China. Like, great for yes, you. Yes, like <laughs> double down on that. Yeah. Like who would, I mean, 
I, I <laughs> we've seen you know some of these logistical operations up close at like the manifest conference for example where you can see these robotics and like these intricate yes. systems that truly is fascinating mm -hmm. and i can totally empathize oh. with is getting an opportunity like that being able to getting a flight getting travel accommodations to go to another it, most people would not turn that opportunity down yeah um I, I would have had a lot more respect for her if she just doubled down on it and yeah. she said hey you know th this is what i'm doing and this is why i'm doing it and 90 percent of y'all would do the exact same things 90 yeah. percent of y'all would take this trip um but now she has since um she has deleted all those videos promoting um the i guess behind the scenes not tours that she's done but behind the scenes conversations because she called herself an investigative journalist <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, you take outfit photos. <laughs> you are not oh an investigative God. journalist. <laughs> it's a completely different oh skill set. She's she's a, she's a logistics person and an investigative <laughs> journalist. It's like we do not accept you. Yeah, exactly. I know those people. Say no. <laughs> they don't have time for whatever you're doing right now. Oh my God, that's so funny. You know, it's it's tough because. I am excited when you talk about visibility tech in this space. I think it'll be much easier as we move forward to get more insight into like our supply chains and be able to say, hey, this is who I'm buying from. This is where the product's from. It's just, you know, hmm. I want maybe I'll just let's play men for this one because at the end of the day, <laughs> we just need dresses sometimes for events to look good really fast. And if society hadn't put that pressure on women for hundreds of years, maybe she and wouldn't be what it is today. So <laughs> I, I need to actually link in um, <laughs> the show my, notes. That's my conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> I I embarrassingly like know um, very little about like the fast fashion supply chain. Uh, I I should know more, but I think a part of me for a long time did not want to know because yes. it's almost like you know where you know when you start asking questions of like where do the eggs come from? Where does meat come from? And then you start yeah. diving into a lot of those different questions. I don't I don't want to know those answers. I just want to be in peace. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it kind of goes back to like my earlier point of like so much of this responsibility is put on the consumers. And so if this responsibility is put on the consumers, there's a certain level of exhaustion that comes into play where sometimes you want to be really, really a morally a good person. And sometimes you need a dress in two days. Uh, it's it's yeah. going to happen. Some days your morals are going to be a little bit compromised. And I don't think that, you know, consumers should uh, have the re bear that responsibility, you know, all of the time where, like I said earlier, there's the overwhelming, the top 100 companies have contributed to more than 70% of emissions since the 1980s. And so yeah. that's where the blame should be that's where the change should be but that youtube video talked about how you know how where did fast fashion you know sort of wh where was it born and when did the concepts of like fashion begin and you know how did they start you know uh, replicating outfits because before fashion very much was like you uh, one artist made clothing for one person and it was somebody who was very well to do royals um you know that that sort of market and it wasn't until the early 1900s that these machines started being industrialized and that's when fast fashion started so it was like english countrysides apparently what happened is and all these farmers were kicked out of their lands in like the, the British UK area. They were kicked off their land. And when they were kicked off their land, they were forced to move into these bigger cities. Well, the bigger cities had all of the factories in it. And so that's where yeah. the concept of fast fashion was born. And then when it became like, you know, politically not good to have those uh, fast fashion factories in the UK area, then they started searching for other areas. So they started um, searching for other areas of the world to outsource that part of the production. And that's how, you know, fast fashion was born. So it's, it, I thought it was super interesting that, you know, a lot of those same issues that were developed in one country were just, they knew of them, they knew of these issues, and they still chose to outsource to other countries. And so, that's where like the onus of, you know, greenwashing comes into play, which is starting to become, you know, more apparent, you know, they, a lot of food brands will use the phrase like organic, 
there's no sort of government regulating body that can determine if something is truly organic or not. It's kind of a marketing ploy. So now we're starting to see this with retailers who are saying like, oh, you know, sustainably sourced, but then you do a little bit of digging and uh, they're not so sustainably mm -hmm. sourced. So one app that I did find that can help you if you are looking um, to maybe start slowly changing your habits, your purchasing habits of getting away from, you know, I need the dress in two days to these other brands and and one uh, one site that you can look this up is called good for you and so they will basically go to a brand's website they have a certain amount of criteria on where the sources come from um what the the labor you know the what the workers envir labor environment looks like um and then you know return shipping and how long the gar you know what kind of materials are in the stuff that you make um polyester i i uh, heard is one of the worst, I guess, offenders because they have so much min like uh, the what is it, the microplastics in their yeah. materials, so that yep. when you wear them, they don't last very long. Yep. And to your point earlier, we're buying so much more clothing now, but that clothing isn't lasting as long. It's being sent to a landfill where it's something mm -hmm. like a dump truck of clothes are burned every second of the day globally. So we're consuming so much more and polyester materials are, are a big part of that. And they're getting found in like these deep sea ocean animals where like 70% of the animals in like the, the deep sea have microplastics inside of them. And they think that that's how is because of these clothings that are made of plastic end up in our water systems. And, you know, it's just a whole chain of events. Really crazy. It's uh. I think I think I had a couple of facts up here too when I did something in fast fashion. Uh, yeah, sixty percent of most of it's made from the plastic based materials, like you said, and then the text the textile dyeing, actually twenty percent of global wa mm. waste uh, water comes from just the dyeing process itself. So, oh wow, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, not good for the environment, uh, but it's it's tough because, like you said, like. Uh, the average person buys at least 14 items of new clothes every single year. So from what she point, in. Yeah. So at one point, are we? <laughs> yeah. Where do you, where do down. you, and, and from that same video, it was, they also said the average person buys a new piece of clothing every five days. So if you're buying those pieces yeah. of clothing and they're only lasting, you know, maybe two, three times that you're going to wear them, that's where, these other companies that are coming like the the good for you site where they'll go and they'll analyze all of those things of like what the brand is saying sustainability wise if it's just kind of bullshit or if they're you know actually a good company so they have a ranking of like five different you know like uh, avoid or we support um, one of the companies that I thought was really cool that probably deserves a little bit of a deep dive maybe you know an idea for a future point of sale episode is sheep Inc. They, mm. they make um, wool. So wool is like apparently like the superstar as far as like sustainable fabrics. Cotton is next, but you know, the recyclability of it is yeah. a little bit questionable, but wool apparently is, is like the upper echelon of, of quality fabrics um, that can be reused and reworn for years. And it had, you know, less of an environmental impact, all that good stuff. Um, but this company Sheep Inc, and every purchase you make, they will send you a button with your wool clothing so you can see the entire supply chain of that product and the impacts that have each part of that supply chain so like and you could also see the sheep that your piece of clothing came from oh they're not dead so yeah <laughs> At first I was right. like, wait. So it's, they're still alive. Yeah, yeah they're still so alive. I think that's part of the sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh wait. <laughs> yes, no, that's good. Good. <laughs> um, but it looked it looked really cool. My first thought though, because I, it, that's always like I guess where my first thought though goes is okay, these buttons that you're sending, how sustainable are the buttons? Um so that was sort of like my first point. I was like, hmm. How sustainable are we if we're sending, you know, an electronic device um, and that was probably made from plastic? Um, I don't know what the actual button looks like, um, but I have <laughs> seen the button in action and the content that they give you, which I think is really um, interesting because you can see the entire supply chain, including the sheep that your your clothing came from. That's interesting. Uh, that would be cool to like have. Mm -hmm. But then again, you're also thinking like as a buyer and I'm buying something every five days at some point, I'm like, who cares? 
I did. Th well, the also the the button, like the the novelty of it, would be so cool for like five seconds. Exactly. And then like, what do you do I, with the button? By storing these buttons somewhere. Yeah, like <laughs> I feel like they could probably just maybe send you a link. We're basically the... tearing this up Shark Tank style right now. We're like, hmm. <laughs> well, that's actually a perfect segment. <laughs> or a perfect transition to go into our next segment, which uh, we wanted to talk about. The, or, or wait, I guess I should probably ask it. Any last thoughts on, on sort of fast fashion and what uh, folks can do or not do? Or uh, I would say I think there's uh, there's other things to consider, too, when you look at the fast fashion uh, behemoths out there. IP is one of them. You brought this up, right? Like mm -hmm. it could a lot of a lot of celebrities and a lot of people have sued these companies for stealing their ideas in uh, different oh, uh, styles and stuff like that. So always consider that, right? Like, uh, are you also hurting the person that came up with this idea? Imagine you came up with this yourself. Are you happy that China is just pushing these things out at no cost to you really, or them? Um, that's another thing I have with it, but it's also, I think just being, uh, being a uh, reasonable as a consumer, if you don't like it and you're going to stand up and to the point where you're going to shame someone on Instagram about it, you better not order anything off that site again. Right. right. Like just uh, talk the talk, walk the walk type of situation I think is, is big here. I don't think they're going away anytime soon. I think that they could, easily make themselves adhere to sec rulings if there are any but that's the thing i don't think we'll see any so it's kind of like a kick rock situation especially it really depends right we have an election coming up where that could go too yeah pretty well said so um i guess to be continued especially yes. in in that world but I'll, I'll leave a couple of those helpful links in the show notes should you want to you know sort of take your I guess morality to the next level and and start yeah. searching for you know these companies that are are trying to do good and they deserve to be supported because that that's a really good point you brought up about you know some of these smaller designers and creators who are coming up with these different outfit ideas and then they're getting counterfeited essentially yeah. which we yeah. all know the counterfeit market in China is ridiculous yeah um, there's hardly any kind of laws to protect the Etsy sale sellers have been going through this um, you know even you know some of the the shoppers on on Amazon. Amazon who sell custom items that is what, what happens which is super interesting is that a lot of these companies will rip off the original design of like yeah. American companies and then they'll get all of these other shops or all of these other fake accounts to try to review bomb or to try yeah. to you know get takedown notices for the original creator of it so yeah. there's a lot of like kind of like, uh, I guess, retail warfare that's going on. Um, yeah. In addition to, you know, the, the ethical nature of the, the, the where you're buying the products. So there's a whole lot of strings to pull on that discussion, but um, felt like uh, we, we needed to defend the logistics girlies out here um, from getting oh infiltrated. You know me, guys, I'm <laughs> about logistics. Like, well, yeah. What's funny is that she said logistic. She didn't say yeah. logistics. Yeah. <laughs> dead I, dead I, ringer. You know me, guys, I'm about logistic. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> all right let's move on to our uh oh. next topic which speaking of you know shark tank that we mentioned just briefly um, i want to talk a little bit about the business best business models in freight i a little you know behind the scenes you know I, I mentioned earlier that spi logistics is a, a company that is title sponsor for this podcast um so i've been creating some content on the side to add up to to add to my site in order to create like these helpful guides sort of helpful resources and then promote the interviews that we've been doing with those freight agents. So it's a freight agent model, which for folks who don't know, um, a freight agent is essentially someone who has, you know, a handful of a couple customers, maybe a handful of customers, you have a book of business as a freight broker, um, you then go out on your own, and you start managing those customers and managing them yourselves. Um, and now there's not now, I don't know how long, you know, freight agent programs have existed, I imagine they've existed for a while. Um, but they, they haven't really been marketed too well. And so uh, that's where I'm, you know, coming up with these guides just to sort of be that helpful resource for them. But more and more, I think about it. I'm, I'm wondering if the freight agent model is one of the best models for entrepreneurs in freight. 
And I'm curious to hear your thoughts because for folks who don't know, you know, if you have your book of business, you don't, if you're afraid, you don't have to worry about technology upgrades. You don't have to worry about, you know, back office, accounting, things like that. The, the parent company, whoever you're part of that program takes care of all of those things for you. So you can just focus ideally on your customers, maybe getting new customers, but primarily you're working with a handful of customers and you're moving their freight. And um, if you, you can, it, it's a really lucrative also position as well, much better than, you know, sort of, I guess, working the the well, pounding the phones at like a you know a big time uh 3pl i won't name any names here um but yeah. i think it's one of those models that is really really underserved and it's one of those opportunities that if i wasn't so annoyed with like the break broker or break freight break, break, freight broker floor i probably would have gone into something like this um what what are your thoughts on on sort of the the freight agent model because i know you had some ideas on on what maybe some other bi uh, good business opportunities would be uh so i think i have mixed feelings on it it really just depends on how the, it's actually set up i think mm -hmm. that for a younger person just getting into the business it's it, it would be a lot more difficult to mm -hmm. i think get ramped up and going uh i think if you are one of those individuals who i know a lot of freight agents who have been like shipper managers in the past and they kind of transition into this role uh i think it's a yeah you're right it's a really great way to make a living uh but it depends again it depends on who you're working for like i know also though a lot of freight agents you take you take just as many calls after hours you don't really have mm -hmm a team to fall back on uh, as much as you would if you were at a larger brokerage. Now, I will say larger brokers, you do that stuff too. Like mm -hmm. uh, ask people to answer the phones late at night. So, so, to, so to, to say that you wouldn't do that at either or is probably not fair. But um, I would say as an employee, yeah, I do. I do like the agent model. I think there's been some push back away from it for a couple of reasons. One, um, a lot of like tax law, right? How are you paying the agents? How, hmm. how are, are they full-time employees? Are you dictating their work? Kind of like the whole uh, ABF type of situation or AB, sorry, AB, AB5 situation that you've seen like with drivers out in California, like that kind of, uh, those issues have come up because I know there was uh a time where we're considering doing more of like a freight agent program uh, in my past, but uh, the way that we'd have to pay them and pay taxes, like just wasn't convenient. So uh, for either side, there's m people losing money on both sides. So that was part of it. Uh, I also would be a little bit fearful of like regulations that could potentially come up. Like right now, I know that the FMCSA is looking to redefine what a dispatcher on uh, a, a freight agent and a broker is huh. so being in that kind of space i would be i would be nervous to maybe enter until i'm oh, sorry i don't know what i have going on right now it's <laughs> needs an alarm but i'm late <laughs> um so yeah i don't know i i i think you also get less control over it right so dependent on the agency and how it's developed sometimes uh like the parent company will let you pick a name right landstar i think has done this a couple times right uh where their offices kind of go after go by different names hmm. um so you could create like your own identity that way but my other fear would be that as I'm going out and cold calling, if I am an agent and someone experienced a bad situation underneath a different agent of the same company, maybe they look at me that way, right? You're still under this like umbrella of a company. Hmm. So it, it, it depends. I'd have to look at it. I'd, ha I'd, I'd definitely say if you're going into an agent role, like check all of your paperwork, ask about 401k. That's also my fear, right? Is that a lot of time agents like, look at it like an uber driver like yeah you're making great money up front but are you 1099 are you considering their taxes that you have mm. to pay are you considering the benefits that you might have to pay for yourself uh, and all of that is that worth the time um or just going underneath a uh, large brokerage as a remote worker right so uh there's definitely ways to go past it i would say though uh leading wise 
if I had to choose, like if I was going to start a company and choose which one I wanted to do, I, I would probably avoid agent at all costs. Hmm. And that's because I'm a control freak and I want to make, <laughs> well, you know, if I want the experience it's, and this is where, this is where the non-competes I think come into play hmm. because especially for an agent situation, this is where the, the questions start to arise. If you have an, uh, let's say ABC steel company is working with, jessica and they love the work that she's doing jessica decides to retire is the loyalty with jessica or is it with uh landstar right mm -hmm. or someone like that or is it with spi so you you get stuck in this situation where you're just like um i want to be able to control my brand as like maybe leadership or as an owner and that means i want to control the experience that everyone's having regardless of who that person is that's answering those questions so i definitely see uh positives in all directions i would bet that the way that technology is more accessible and usable today free agents have a lot more resources in in front of them that they probably had in the didn't have in the past mm -hmm. uh, which is could be very useful uh right now that technology is starting to get out there more and there's so many different ways that you can in easily invest in your transportation business where in the past it was uh, I'd say a lot more upfront costs like that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I think I've always been a fan as a scaling company. If someone, a company that wants to keep growing, it gets messier and messier, the more agents that you have and less that you can control. Right. So in your experience, do you know if a, a lot of these companies that have freight agent programs, if they also have an in-house brokerage team? That's I've and I kind of think this is maybe where the FMCSA is like, no, we need to define these people differently. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, but there is a company that I've knew of after my experience that I was introduced to. And I remember like trying to figure out how they grew so fast numbers wise. I was like, mm -hmm. wow, for you guys to only be a couple years old, like you guys got really grabbed some revenue and and they had actually worked a deal out with their past agency kind of like a transitioning deal where it was like we want to start our own thing but we don't have the back office that you have we don't have the technology we're not going to be able to afford that up front for the first two years as we run this business if we kick you a certain percent back can we use your resources and then kind of like do it like a step program out of the relationship and so mm -hmm. i think there's like different situations where like those or people have done that before um but if there's if that's how they're adding to it again i would be interested in what they're taking from you because and i don't mean taking from you like they don't deserve it but if i am supporting an in-house brokerage that's supporting your selling operations then you're probably making a little bit less than you would if you were just handling it all yourself, I would assume. Yeah, because I, I used to do um, agent commission. That was one of my, my first big responsibilities when I was an executive assistant is, OK, we have, you know, a, a dozen agents. Um, we need somebody to do the commission reports. And so I would have mm -hmm. to go through and do the commission reports. And typically, if they were a good agent, you could get up to 80 percent of your revenue. So 20 percent goes to the program company and the agent gets 80 uh, percent. Most of them that I saw and that I hear about today are 70, 30. Uh, there were some companies that were 60 40, especially like for, you know, if you're just getting started, if you've never been a freight agent before, um, those are typically the numbers that you're going to get. And, but for some of these guys, if you have a big customer, you know, these to recruit one freight agent could make a huge impact on your bottom line. But there's also the, I, I guess, the worry, I think, from the agent's point of view is if you have an in house brokerage team. Because if you have an in-house brokerage team, then that loyalty that that customer has 
could technically go to the company and not to you who has spent years sort of cultivating yes. that relationship. Um, so there is a little bit of a worry, especially among freight agents, to go to companies that also have an in-house brokerage team. So where yes. I was, that we did have an in-house brokerage team. Um, and we were trying to build the freight agent um, program up, but this was, I mean, this was like 15 years ago. So I'm sure, you know, a lot of things have changed since then. Um, but I know that that's a big selling point for SPI is that they don't have the in-house brokerage team. They only focus on their agents. So they have a corporate team that like, you know, handles all, you know, like HR, technology, um, custom integrations, you know, uh, things like, you know, accounting, stuff like that. Um, yeah. But they don't have anybody in their offices, like calling to, you know, check loads or anything like that. It's it's all on the agent, um, which is, you know, maybe what they prefer, maybe what they maybe that's a little bit of um, a, a safer place to go is what I would imagine. Yeah, I would agree, especially if you're a little bit newer too, and you want that support. I think that's that's really smart too. And just make sure that you're, yeah, you're getting your share and um, it, it should, I assume it works out pretty well for them then. Yeah. I mean, well, I know with SBI in particular, they don't take new agents. You have to have, um, you have to be an established, uh, you know, freight agent. So it's typically um, them leaving another provider to come to SBI or somebody who's like already in freight sales that has a book of business that doesn't have to worry about the non-compete um, so those are the, the two markets that um, they go after, um, which is probably the same for, you know, a lot of these, you know, freight agent companies out here. But I think only a handful of them actually do, does Landstar have an in-house brokerage team. Do you know? Ugh, I don't think so. I'm pretty just because of the way that they've worked. Uh, I'm pretty certain that they have the individual offices have like are run as like individual brokerages hmm. like as an agent you can kind of grow your own office right yeah um and that's how they kind of support it instead but that's a good question i'm not but it might also be a little bit different for them too because you know you have to get your, like your licenses and stuff like that so as like a broker are you still buying those licenses if you're afraid it's all good good questions i guess i, I should ask you know the podcast sponsor yeah <laughs> and that would be a, hey, that would actually that? make for a great future conversation on what is the nuances of these things and and what does it matter and why but i know that that one point of do you have an in-house brokerage team or not matters to agents in particular because they don't want you know the competition from the in-house brokerage team to you know take their customers or have the threat of that even or perceived threat of that even happening yeah very you yeah, see uh it's interesting i'm looking up a, so there's a uh so like for instance for landstar agent program it says become a satellite office for shipment transport so hmm. don ellis and I don't know Don, so if, if good service, bad service, I don't know. You figure out yourself, audience. But so that's what, so Don's like built his own satellite office up called Shipment Transport that works underneath the Landstar MC, hmm. right? And so it looks like um, he's got contractor. You can be a contractor where you basically do what he's doing, uh, an employee. See, and this is like, you get health insurance. So that's, that's the biggest thing is I would be concerned less with like how I'm backed up and more about how I'm being compensated as a whole, hmm. because the contractor side of it, which is more of the agent side of it is like tax benefits from owning your own business. Right. So you got to figure that all about yourself. Um, and then the other very one, complicated. It is, and that's I'm finding like, that out right now. <laughs> people think that stuff is a lot easier than it is, and it's not. And that's what my biggest fear is that people get, you know, into this, and then they hit get hit with their tax bill, not realizing, yeah, seventy percent commissions all great until thirty percent of that's taken away in taxes at the end of the year. Too. Or if you're you hire an accounting team to take care of it, and they miss one of those payments. And then the IRS yes. comes back on you a year and a yes. half later, which is currently what I'm um, experiencing. So, yeah, exactly. it's not fun. Even if you hire a company to take care of it for you, it's still, you know, that little line on your taxes that you have to sign that even if a CPA, you know, did these for you, you're still responsible and yada, yada, yada. This is interesting. It says uh, any direct customer brought to the agency by you at the time you joined us will pay 6%. We, we will pay 6% commission on Landstar trucks. 
and you will have an 88 8 to 12 split when moved with an outside carrier. Hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. How does oh, that so work? that's how they have their own truck. So that's how they're an asset based freight agent model. Okay. Yes. So they have their own trucks. Um, and so that's that dedicated freight or those dedicated equipment is going towards, you know, their agent freight. See, and this is how, this is where this stuff really irritates. And so I, I tell people like read the fine print, for example, how the 88, 12 split works. You take the total, you're billing the customer and you have 88% to work with. So, so you're <laughs> already, this is already hilarious. Uh, and so like, let's just say 90 to make that easier. So if you get a thousand dollars from the customer, you only have $900 to work with. And the margin you will make on that 900 is, is what you, so if you get the carrier to haul 75%. So if you get the carrier to take it for 750, the bill amount you would make is 13%. So if you pay the care 80%, you would make, so 800, you would make 8% of that hundred dollars of that of that difference yeah so you're making eight bucks and see how like that like even when you say 88 that's not what you think at the end of the day so that's mm -hmm. where it's like commission plans are really interesting to me and so i'll just always read especially if you're going down the agent route just read them really really well because i mean that's you're basically making eight bucks a load and how many low that's the other thing right how many loads can you book without losing your mind in a day right and so you're still probably doing all of the tracking and all of the communications and did the driver fall off you got to find another one like you're probably still doing all of those things exactly so let's say that you're like a badass i forgot i was on the radio if i could swear let's say you're like a badass and you book 50 loads a day i mean let's say on average you're making eight bucks so that's four hundred dollars that's that's pretty great but it says up here at that in your own employee you're also making nine dollars an hour so um nine times nine 81 so you made 481 dollars that day but you have to tax it which is probably going to be close to we'll just say 40 percent. so you made 224 bucks that day which is is not terrible and that's based off 50 loads which is a lot i was gonna say yeah i i, I want to say that that's not average at all especially no. in this market no like that i'm assuming you've worked there for a couple of years you got some company you know takes like 20 low yeah that's a lot of work so yeah you're basically making an average salary at the end of the day and that's where uh, they uh, agent models annoy me because they do all this stuff that makes it look really fun and easy and then you end up just making a teacher salary at the end of the year it's like which is all the more reason to research those yes. freight agent programs before and search best freight agent program in order to well, find and it, it kind of goes back to like for me personally i think we've talked about this in the show before it goes back to like your question on like what's the right number right for a truck driver like what numbers do it it depends i mean mm -hmm. hell if you're a stay-at-home mom and you just want some extra cash a freight agent is like probably a great job for you to take yeah. right like that's not bad at all to contribute an extra thirty thousand dollars a year to your household with yeah that's not insignificant no so the job might and that's not from be... one company based on like yes. loose math that we're doing you know in, yes. in 30 seconds um, exactly. so take it with a grain of salt on in in that regard um, exactly. but <laughs> but it's definitely one of those because we are writers i don't know that we're mathematicians yeah <laughs> but you we're not a freight broker we you know you 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 know the ropes of, of how some of these things work so um it's interesting to dive into what each of these companies are offering where it makes the most sense and what your true costs are going to be all of these questions um, can be answered as you go through that sort of that review process with um, you know a potential partner um, if you're going to take that route but I think you you had another um, business idea in freight that you thought um, more people should be aware of what, what's that uh what was that I know I put in my <laughs> notes to you last night I'm not. <laughs> it was a late night. I, will I think say it was that. something related to like freight oh, tech. Oh yes, yes, yes. So I, I was, I was kind of thinking in in the regards to this, like, what would I do if I ever went back into it? Like, what would I do? And for me, I think 
the move is and it's interesting tonight well this will be late but uh go check out uh my serious xm show i'm gonna have rick larkin on the show tonight oh. everyone yeah bcb transfer the, the loudest guy in freight that's what i like to call him <laughs> Uh, he wakes up like that and, uh, he's got, he's got a bigger TV setup than freight waves itself. And I, <laughs> and I would, I would hate him for it if it wasn't sonar plastered on it all day long. Like it's just, it's just awesome advertising for us. But, uh, I was learning about some work that he's been doing with a company called optimal dynamics. And long story short is they help companies like BCB transport other logistics companies, uh, take a hold of their data and really start to optimize back office processes and decision making, right? Like, how are you choosing what load to put on a carrier? And they, they really try to dismantle the thought process of someone like Rick, who's run a trucking company for decades, right? And what's really interesting is it the change management part is really what not only Rick learned the most from, but even optimal dynamics as well. I can't tell you how many times I, I talk to people and I say, you know, this type of tech I think is very interesting. Have you looked into it? And they, they maybe have, or they had a bad experience. Um, I see this a lot too. Like when people trying to look into like outsource, maybe use companies like lean solutions, things like that. And whenever you're making an investment into that type of space, it takes change management. I was having a really great conversation with Evan Shelley about this at uh, the future supply chain, because um, the easiest change management is telling people to stop doing that and start doing it this way. It just, hmm. and, and just stop, you know, like, well, what if we just like, nope, just like stop. And like, as humans, like you want to stay so close to like what we know and the, and the actions that we take on a normal basis, right? Like um, whether it's like when you shower or, or how often you're um, exercising, right? It's like we get stuck in our ways and we want to push against what people are telling us just because we're not comfortable with it, even if it's best. And I think that's a lot of the work I was doing before I, I entered into the space that I'm in now. And I just, I find it really interesting how we need people still, we need the human mind in this mm -hmm. space, but we also need to leverage the technology better. And I, I love being able to, s there's nothing I find more fulfilling than sitting with a entry level employee or a lower level employee who's in it every day grinding and you get them to maybe do something a little bit differently and it clicks you know like it works and they see it and they're like oh okay it, like that i think is so much fun and that's where technology really starts to work and that's where you know rick himself was even you know they they ended up finding that he could run the operation making the same revenue he's doing with 16 less trucks oh, than wow. he was he was so flip that around they were able to find ways for him just in the fleet he had alone to increase revenue per truck by t almost 20 percent and that's just by instead of saying hey whatever decision you used to make when choosing a driver in the past choose let the let the ai let the technology choose for you and see what mm -hmm. happens and that's just like where i like to challenge people is like try it try some of this stuff and see if it works for you um and the other side that I find interesting is like, why, why won't you like what's mm. push, what's keeping humans like so focused on doing things old school that they're not willing to change a little bit. So change management, I think is going to be huge in this industry. The more tech that we add, the more data that we consume, change management is going to become, I think, pretty big. So that's, that's where I would eventually like to get into at some point. That's um there there's a, a gentleman by the name of Eric Kimberling I think I'm pronouncing his last name right but he um focuses specifically on change management um at the software level um, mm -hmm. I was on his podcast I think a, about a year ago and he has a social media presence and this kind of con like I guess a little bit kind of related to to what you're talking about that kind of content does really well because and I think it does really well because a lot of people struggle with it they struggle yeah. with on oh, picking a new software and why and what what that looks like because sometimes the, these purchases are made in a vacuum where you know it's a VP that got sold on it and you know they want to buy the shiny new tech toy 
And then they don't actually talk to the people in the trenches that are going to be using this, uh, these tools and how it would fit into their day. So it's almost like forced on some employees yeah. versus like, it, is this actually going to make sense for how we operate our company today? Which, you know, kudos to, to Optimal Dynamics for, for helping folks to save money with their existing equipment and not, you know, having to, you know, purchase, you know, 17 more trucks and you're, you're, you know, it will, you'll run more efficiently or, you know, whoever is, is trying to sell that notion. Yeah, it was interesting. They're very open and honest about it. Like, you know, I think the tech people want to go in and just say, just click the button, Rick, and it'll mm -hmm. work, you know, and you can't do that with certain types of customers. And so they found like, not only did they learn a lot about the industry by sitting someone in the office every single day, they, I, they like, they used, they had like a special day of the week that they would, it's like, optimal optimal dynamics day or something like that where to like slowly get them into it like once a week they would only only the robot can make the decision like not and so oh, wow. that slowly cool. got them to understand but it also gave the bcb team time to sit back and say well i know it's choosing this but it can't choose this because maybe x y and z that the hmm. algorithm hasn't truly picked up yet so both sides were like, no, there, this takes learning and time and it's worth the investment. Like for optimal dynamics, it's worth putting someone in there to have a long-term customer. Right. Yeah. And a really and great outcome. They also, I, I met them at manifest because their, their CEO is really personable. Um, yes. I actually, I filmed, uh, I think you were, you saw me uh, filming these like one minute logistics videos and it's actually with their CEO. Um, so I, I did one of them with them and it was just on a whim because I stopped by their booth and they had the one of the coolest like marketing promo items I've ever seen. I, I wish I still had it, but I kind of ripped it up just to see what the guts looked like of it. But it was a booklet. That's a cardboard booklet and sprayed it, of course. But you open up the booklet and automatically a video with sound plays. So it just felt like a normal, like kind of brochure kind of yeah. product. But as soon as you opened it up, a video is playing inside of the, the promo. So it gives like a full like one minute explanation on who wow. Optimal Dy Dynamics is. And the marketing director, um, uh, she was saying how she had to ha hand program each one of these things by loading on the file onto it. So that's, that's why I ripped it apart just to see like how that process looked. But I kept that thing <laughs> for like four months just because it was so cool. And I would just periodically hit, hit play on it. Love that. No, it's uh, a great company. And uh, hopefully you guys check out the episode. I I'd like to have them. I think we're going to try to get them on Thomas's show too. So, but go check it out. They, uh, I did an article on the partnership and it's, it's pretty interesting. I'm excited. To s I I'm going to be able to hear a little bit more of Rick's side uh, mm -hmm. in the interview tonight. So I'm excited to, to hear more about maybe his pain points too. So it should be fun. Yeah, he, he's good people. I love seeing yeah. what they're doing with um, BCB Live, which is different from BCB Transport. BCB Transport is their trucking division. So they have to completely kind of, even though they have the same name, but they kind of have to split those two off because of what BCB Live is, is doing with the big TV, with you know their new yes. broadcast building that they just um, built out. So they're, they're doing a lot of really cool things. Um, so, so shout outs to them. All right, next topic. Um, do the people want us to dunk on Meghan Markle more? I think that is a <laughs> yes. Because for folks who uh, do not know, um, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, uh, they famously scored a couple uh, deals to sell out their entire family and future opportunities to uh, Netflix and to Oprah and to also Spotify as well. All exclusive deals that are currently not getting renewed. Also, fun fact. Um, if you try to search for the famous uh, Harry and Meghan interview on Oprah's website, it is no longer on the website. Really? Curious. <laughs> Curious. Really? <laughs> really? Oprah? I did the search Oprah myself. Um, well, what oh. I think happened is because they spilled so uh, Oprah, you know, wants to get, get in with the royal family and has wanted to for years. But you got to play ball if you go in with the royal family. They'll, they'll give you news. They'll, they'll give you access. But you, they're a lot like the NFL where if they're going to give you access, they're going to dangle it like a carrot. And if you uh, don't do well with that access, you're, you're not going to be approved wow. for, for future scoops. 
So, um, yeah, so that interview was conducted, but I would imagine that Oprah regrets that now because uh, she is no longer in the royal family circle. Um, which brings us back to uh, those, all of those exclusive deals that are evaporating very, very quickly. And one of those is the podcast um, so, archetypes. <laughs> so crazy, dude. So insane. Are you going to share with everyone what happened? No, go, go, go. You, you sound like you, you, you're ready. <laughs> so apparently this, this chick wasn't even doing the interviews the whole time. They were just, they sent an intern in there and then the intern was asking the questions and then they just recorded over her speaking, which puts the whole, uh, uh, not Whitney Houston. Um, uh, oh my God. Mariah Carey episode into a complete different view for me because now I understand why she got so mad so fast because some little intern over here, first of all, Mariah Carey show. Can you imagine Mariah Carey shows up to this little booth and she's like, okay, who are you? <laughs> like we're talking about Mariah Carey, like the right. most diva as person in the whole world. And then this little uh, peon of a person who no one's ever heard of start talking to Mariah Carey about how she's a diva and I would have been I I put like I said that whole episode put into perspective because I thought that she was just upset with the way that what's her name was talking well because her, Megan. Megan asked her so archetypes is you know that I guess the the thought process behind it if I'm trying to put myself in her mind um was she wanted to pick us a, a movie star and then a phrase that has quote unquote negative connotations to it. Yeah. Try to make it empowering. That was her her goal with the podcast. And so diva was the phrase for Mariah. Um, I forget what the phrase was for uh, Serena, but it, it, to your point, she's inviting these very high caliber people that are showing up to the studio that Spotify paid to have built inside of her own house. Meghan Markle's house because she could not, um, she wasn't producing any episodes. And so they thought if we build a studio in your home, it will make it a lot easier for you to produce more episodes. That did not work. What was um, she doing this whole time? She had 26 people. And I think I've, I've said this before, but she had 26 people working on this podcast, which would explain um, the interns asking the questions. So if these high caliber stars are showing up to your podcast, arguably they're doing you probably the favor, um, not the other way around. Maybe at that time they thought, oh, we're going to go, you know, sit down with a, somebody who is royal, married into royalty, I should say. Uh, and we'll get the caliber of, of maybe that access. Um, no, it's, it's, it was other people asking these high caliber people the questions and then they would edit in, redub uh, Megan would record separately asking the questions and then they would dub those in as if it was a conversation that the two of these people shared. I want to know what Beyonce thinks about <laughs> this because of that whole, in that whole Netflix remember she, she's like, Oh my God, Beyonce texted me and she's like, keep doing what you're doing girly or something. Logistics girly. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> I doubt she's sending those texts now. <laughs> There's no way. I, I guarantee Oprah bringing that down sounds like a Beyonce phone call, like a late night Oprah. Take this woman down. like Or just, you know, Oprah trying to apologize to the royal family somehow um, in order to get that kind of access because the royal family is going to be around for, I mean, maybe generations. We, I guess we'll find out. They've been around for a thousand years. So chances are they're going to be around for a little bit while longer, much longer than somebody like Megan. But I just find it so fascinating how you had such an opportunity of a lifetime to be brought in to make his be a part of history books for years and years. And you claim to have all of these things that you care about so desperately, you know, women's empowerment and equal rights and, uh, you know, campaigning for these issues all over the you had that opportunity to be that change you want to see in the world. And you just shit all over it to the point where these companies are saying goodbye. Oprah's yeah. taking down your interview. You're not getting the calls back and people are seeing you for the grifter that you are. And then it just, 
it's so crazy to know that Prince Harry is not, you know, he, he definitely has fault in this. But how could you not see this? How could you not see these red flags ahead of time? And you chills, chose this life. It's wild Honestly. to me. He said, he said goodbye to everything, everything he's ever known for this woman. And now he's an embarrassment. He's a laughing stock on South Park. It was so great because he almost was a laughing stock before, you know, and it's just like, he just, he just, he said, I'm going to double down on this. <laughs> Which is also interesting. Like, it's, to know he's how so bad. People don't even make ginger jokes about him anymore. Right. They're just like, you're way past no soul. Like, <laughs> it's just, he was protected. I think it's so much more clear now how much he was protected by the royal family where they put him in positions where he could be the lovable goofball that, you know, pokes fun at his brother and, you know, his his brother is fine with it. If but if this was a hundred years ago, even two hundred years ago, if you were talking about the future king in that regard, or the future queen, like both of them two would be hung out in the street. They it would it, they off with their heads, like would not it, this would not be a discussion that would be had anymore. Like and that's what's so fascinating to me is that he has just completely ruined this this is the second son syndrome which i, yeah, I think oh, i've yeah. talked about before you know on here that it's just so fascinating what goes on in these in these the heads of men that are not going to be the king or not going to succeed you know whatever throne because there's still like something like a hundred royal families that exist all over the globe still to this day but that you know the firstborn son having that lineage and not being it what that psychologically does to a man i mean there's a whole army in, in game of thrones called the second sons um True. because they're looking for True. purpose in life yeah that's so it's so that's why i was just thinking i was like what do these people do like what are their lives like do they just like wake up and then like do you do you I, think he knows how to pay regular bills no no like way. He's, he, at 40 years old, you don't know anything. Like, uh, like even laundry. Like, I'd, I'd be interested in to, like, knowing. And that's, a, that's why, right, when all this came out, like, what their budget needed to be and all this shit. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, that's it, sure budget if you're going to live in, like, L.A. But why don't you live at somewhere normal, right? You want to be normal so bad. No. Wow. It was all, it was all a ruse. But... Very oh, fascinating. Very, very, um, I guess uh, the, the comeuppance has come and I am I'm cheering it on the entire way. Even one of my, um, I guess, love hate creators who was very like pro Meghan Markle for um, the last like three years. She will look for a way to defend Meghan um, over the last couple of months, though. She's kind of a, it's interesting watching her content shift away from covering anything Meghan Markle related to now she's going to, um, she's focusing on like Kate versus Camilla and making up stories there, which is just, it's like, wow, just, we're just watching her, the, the transition in real life as we speak. Oh my. It's funny because I was like, I wonder what Spotify stock is like, because even I'm sitting here and I'm like, what did remember like wasn't kim kardashian supposed to do like a podcast too for like yep. a ton of money when did that come out but uh, they it didn't um and that's where I, it, the fault is also there's a partial blame for spotify as well because you make you made all of these investments into celebrity talent to create content when a lot of this it, they're not experienced podcasters and podcasters it's a long game it's a lot of hours of investment um you're not going to you know make yeah. i mean unless you're like conan o'brien or somebody who can make that transition from tv to podcasting you know pretty seamlessly which he has done there's not many other people that could do that and there's not you know with podcasting it's, it's a long game and i think for like a kim kardashian type of person it's uh very like short thinking for her maybe oh yeah no it's not doing too hot at least over three years so I was like, what's their, just, what's their stock like? Right around, because I think 21 was when they started announcing all these different things. That was 364. They're at 156 today. Yikes. Yeesh. 
And that's, I mean, a lot of their money is being spent on these, on this talent. That's just, it's also not bringing in the, uh, the audience numbers, unless you're like a Joe Rogan, which is just such an outlier. It's, it's tough yes. to make any kind of comparisons, but as a podcaster too, from the business aspect of it, when you're signing these exclusivity deals you're only on spotify the overwhelming yes. majority of the podcast market still listens on an apple device and so you're just cutting your audience or your your potential audience um by 60 percent just by going exclusive to spotify so it's a little bit tougher to gain that traction even when spotify is like artificially pumping you up to like you know the top five spots which is exactly what they did with megan's podcast when it first mm -hmm. launched they said it was something like the third overall podcast in the world or at one point it, you know, for maybe like two hours, it beat out Joe Rogan's. And I'm like, yeah, not a chance. Now, the Spotify just took that podcast and pumped it up in their ratings in order to try to make, you know, a buck back on these failed investments, these failed exclusivity deals. And I think it's going to be a tough road for a lot of different shows if you choose to go the exclusive route. I, d I just don't see I, I don't see how it makes sense to, to to go to Spotify, even like a like a caller daddy um, situation. Like as soon as her deal is up, uh, she's probably going to leave because she knows that her audience has suffered, um, especially from like a growth standpoint. It was growing a hell of a lot more when it was on Barstool because you're on all the platforms mm -hmm. and versus just Spotify. But she got a $10 million check or like a hundred million or some, something ridiculous um, from Spotify in order to go. And that's life-changing money for her. But for like Harry and Meghan, which is, which Harry, I don't know if you heard of like Harry's podcast ideas because he was originally supposed to be part of this and he never was. Um, but he had pitched different uh, podcast episodes where he would invite um, world leaders on his show and talk to them about their childhood trauma and two of the names that he oh, mentioned no. were vladimir putin and the pope what <laughs> does he have does he think he has that poll too right. where the vladimir the delusions show up? <laughs> if i i mean if i could have anyone i would say <laughs> Putin's got to be the first. Jesus. And Putin's going to come on your show to talk and about his childhood trauma? Yeah. <laughs> no, he's going to talk about your childhood trauma and how he's going to take over your country because <laughs> you're so weak from childhood trauma. Jeez. Ooh, hiccups. That's wild. Oh, well, I guess that's kind of a good point um, to bring up our next topic, and that is um, our favorite conspiracy theories, because uh, it, it's kind of a, you know, when you, I guess you, when you're faking a podcast, it kind of ties into uh, my favorite conspiracy theory at the moment, and that is people faking podcast interviews for clout. So to <laughs> sort of, I guess, you know, set the stage. Proven. <laughs> We're all clout chasers over here, apparently. Oh so like a typical um, interview setup, like like what we're doing here, um, we're talking to each other. And so in post production, we'll be able to edit this video and be able to show like that singular view that that single shot, maybe add some B roll to it. Um, but it, it look that's what every, you know, most content creators are doing is that they're taking they're recording a podcast in a video format like this. And then the video serves as, uh, you know, tools to create social media friendly clips to promote the episode. So sometimes you'll put the full episode up on YouTube, and then you'll make you know, video clips from it. But you'll also have the podcast version as well. Well, there are now quote unquote influencers that are faking this because they want to see more important than they are. And so these are becoming like ad campaigns. They're becoming, uh, they, it's, it's, it's becoming a whole thing. So I'm going to play this video because this actually comes from um, a woman that I actually really like. And she talks about what's going on in social media. Um, but let me go ahead and play the clip. Check. 
Yeah, so obviously the topic is probably not going to be appealing to a lot of folks, but if you were just listening to it, um, basically what they showed is a woman that is sitting at a podcast microphone. She's got the, you know, I guess call out like purple lighting in the background. Um, so it's very like who podcast vibey. Who would do such a thing? <laughs> Tacky. <laughs> um, but uh, then they move into an ad. And so this is performing really, really well from an advertising standpoint. But I just think it's so cringy that you have to, why not just set up an interview with a podcaster who are always looking for guests and topics to discuss? Why go as far as to fake all of these things? Why not just have the discussion and release the entire discussion? Why do you have to go to the links of, you know, almost like the, the influencers that will rent a private jet and it's just like a movie set that they go and take photos in just to have the appearance that they've been on a private jet. That's what this feels like to me. Uh, yeah, a thousand. Yes. I, and I've seen those setups too, where it's like people can go in there, right. And take pictures in the jet and all that stuff. It's, you know, I guess for me, it's like, is the values, the money value really there? Are you spending, are you making that much more off these videos doing that stuff? Because it's so at some level, I can't blame you, but I also, I guess I, I would not be able to live that lie as well. <laughs> like, I think what would be funnier content would be to be in the airplane and then to like jump out of it and someone be like, what's ha that's happening. It's like, it's clearly a fake plane, you know, like that <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't sit somewhere in like a fake environment and just be like, Oh yes. Like even making a fake podcast that I, maybe it's cause I make podcasts all day long here, but uh, that's It takes a lot of time to do that. It's again, one of those situations where it's like, God, if you just would like put that energy towards like creating your own, authentic content wouldn't it life be easier right and wouldn't it make it so much i you know for, from even like a marketing lens like why not set up the interview with a podcaster and then you can take you know that video ahead of you can ask ahead of time hey can i get a copy of the assets whenever we're done recording and when you get it scheduled that's typically um i, I know i provide it i know other podcasters will provide that once the episode goes live of course because you don't want you know somebody else getting the jump on releasing an episode um before you have but they can use that video to create their own social media content because it promotes the show that you were just on so if you can you know do all that for to pose a you know 10 second long video to ask a question why not just invest those same resources into just contacting a podcaster and they can create it you know 30 minutes 45 minutes of content and then you can have dozens and dozens of clips to potentially pick from so it just seems like a gigantic waste and you know now that i've seen it i've seen that that the fake side of those podcast interviews. Now yeah. I, I notice it on a lot more videos now. Um, and it's interesting to see who is taking that as because they're they're typically like the guru types. They're the you know, buy my course that from an industry that I've, I've never worked in type vibes, um, you know, yeah. the business life coach. Um, that's it feels very much like that market to me. Yeah very yeah in your face you want to make a thousand dollars next week here's all right. yeah <laughs> avon or selling some kind of like pyramid scheme or something like that yeah that's what it, it feels it just feels icky to me so so that's my my conspiracy story um grace what's yours <laughs> what is mine um i have uh i have Let's see how this the audience takes to this one. <laughs> uh, this one, I have like no proof, no knowledge. It's just my personal thoughts, my own personal conspiracy theory. I don't think we ever planned on saving those people in Ocean Gate. And <laughs> I was really hoping yours was going to be Titanic related. <laughs> it is Titanic so related. <laughs> because that story is wild. Uh, listen, apparently, like, I heard this fact that we've actually. It's safer to like visit space than it is to go to the bottom of the ocean. So, you if if you were my audience, you know me. I love space. So take that <laughs> as it is. You know, uh, 
and I was so the reason I was reading this article about like what potentially this could have cost like American taxpayers, some blah blah blah. I don't think we were ever really trying to begin with. I just think that we were like, hey, Coast Guard, just like go out there a little bit, right? Uh, because like I was also reading the chances of us, let's say we did find them, like we would have had to like create like something that doesn't exist to like. Go down there, bring it up slowly in enough time that they also had oxygen without it ex exploding inside itself, which it did anyways. And I just, I really don't think anyone tried. And <laughs> I don't blame them in a way for well, it either. Apparently the, um, the U.S. military knew their fate yes. uh, pretty immediately and <laughs> just didn't tell anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So the entire world is obsessing about this and search crews and all, you know, to your point, all of that wasted money. And uh, they knew. It's, it's funny because, you know, my family has like a group chat, you know, and I have like a very liberal family. So it's like it's always like something hopping now. But you got to understand from my perspective, like I'm living and breathing freight all day. And like, so while all this is happening, we're at in Cleveland, you know, and so I'm like just watching our group chat, like, will they be alive? You know, and I'm like, what's fucking going on? It's I'm having like a glass of rose, <laughs> and I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> like, and so like I remember getting home and being like, oh, okay, yeah, they're dead. Like, like it's not. So yeah, I feel bad I, smiling at this moment, but it's also like it just everything that the you only. I will say the only thing I feel awful about is that the sound of the sun i feel awful oh he yeah the night it was, he was like 19 or something he didn't want to go on yeah. it and he begged his father not to and his yeah. father was just adamant yeah also i also feel bad for i usually side with cardi b on all of her opinions but i <laughs> feel bad for her in the the stepson who was apparently at like the blink 182 concert like name a billionaire stepfather who's like who's who's worth like staying at home crying over let that kid go enjoy his blink 182 concert i, I don't know of a billionaire stepfather who's probably the number one dad you know like who's there all day long. and if there is one uh, uh, reach out to me get on twitter i want to meet your billionaire stepdad okay and he's got I need the paperwork that said he's worth a billion dollars because i doubt that he is that awesome I let, maybe he got you the Blink-182 concert tickets. And then in that case, you went in his honor. But I just, I can't, I can't imagine. I get, like, very claustrophobic. And that's the only thing my problem with space is, like, when I get too claustrophobic, like, not being able to, like, walk around, you know? Mm -hmm. I can't, I mean, I... I probably, if I went down, I probably would have been the reason that thing exploded because my ass would have been in the pitch dark, just like, nope, <laughs> banging <laughs> on the walls until it can, uh, and it sounds like they died in a pretty peaceful way, right? Like, I mean, it's about as good as you can go. It's in instant, second, yeah. You turn into molecules. That sounds great. But uh, yeah, anyone who's concerned about taxpayer dollars in this situation, I think I think we're good. I don't think we spent a dime on it, and let's just leave the Titanic alone at this point. Okay. The, um. So a, a related conspiracy theory that it's uh, not the Titanic. That not that one because I do find that one like super interesting. The whole J.P. Morgan was supposed to be on yeah. it, you know, creation of the Fed, all that. Um, the other conspiracy theory that came out from this is the only reason that we and I'm just, you know, sort of paraphrasing this because I don't know exactly all the conspiracy details. Um, but apparently the, the way that we discovered the Titanic wasn't until the early 80s. And we discovered it because we had the when I say we the United States had a couple subs that went missing nuclear subs that went missing. Uh, or no, it was uh, one sub that went missing that had two nuclear warheads on it. So we were looking at the bottom of the goddamn ocean floor to try to find them before obviously anybody else finds them. And that's how they discovered the Titanic, which is also kind of correlates to why the U.S. government would know ahead of time because they were monitoring the area, maybe because they haven't found these nuclear warheads yet. 
So they were all already monitoring the area to see maybe who would come looking for them. You know, it's crazy to uh, talking about this too. And the fact that like I was at this conference and I had no idea what was going on. Uh, did you see the clip of James Cameron? Apparently when they went down there for that first time was on nine 11. Oh, and wow. So, so like, yeah, I'll find the interview. I'll send it to you. So then they like come back up and they're like the hot guy uh, who's like looking for the old lady the whole time. Like the main, I can't remember the actor's oh, name. Yeah. Cause he, he died. Uh, he, the guy from uh, Twister. Yeah, yes, the guy from <laughs> that Twister. Guy. Uh, he's like with Cameron. And he's like, the planes have hit like the towers, and I'm like, whoa, what? Like a crazy, and it's it's something. It's also something too. You think about like, I would never want to tell someone while they're down there in a state where it's like I can't get you back up fast. Right. You know? Same thing with space. It's like I, uh, I can't get you back here fast enough to like for you to. So you just have to like wait till they get back and you're like, by the way, like the world's craziest disaster happened. Is that Bill then, Paxton? That, that was yes, the yes. Uh, actor's name. And it's like crazy because you can see James Cameron's face. He's like, and I was like, we did it. And he's like, terrorist. Oh, <laughs> he's, wow. This is yeah, this. <laughs> if you find the clip, you should add it because it's like, it's so crazy. But yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of nuts to like think. I just think the Titanic's much older than that, too. You know, shout out to my niece on this one, uh, because my niece is incredibly uh, addicted to everything the Titanic. Uh, and so she had to play anyone for her like American history. Mm -hmm. And she played the unsinkable Molly Brown. Oh, and it was like the cutest, the cutest presentation of all time. And I'm like, that's adorable. So. Yeah, that's super. <laughs> I mean, based on I'm kind of a little bit Titanic obsessed, too. And, and coming, you know, from all of this, you know, that all of these stories that have been, you know, surfacing, for lack of a better phrase, um, they there there was one woman that was on TikTok and she was talking about um the car car is it Carpathia the the ship yeah. that came to rescue the Titanic survivors she actually did her um her like master's thesis or PhD thesis on it or whatever and so she oh, was right. writing about you know sort of the the hope of that human beings have and how the second that Titanic sent out the mayday request the people on the Carpathia dropped everything and said, we're coming. We, wow. we got everything for you. We are, we, the, the, the amount of speed of that ship in particular was so much more than they had ever tested. And speaking of which, like they're, they're going through the same waters that the Titanic just went through fear of iceberg. It's, you know, mm -hmm. all of the same precautionary things, but the car people on the Carpathia uh, were so uh, invested in trying to save as many people as they could at, on the Titanic, which I think is just such a, a story that I had never heard of and has a, you know, a much more of like, a, I guess, a, a positive human spin on it. You know, yeah. obviously, there's a lot of death and destruction and hopelessness that happens with something like Titanic. But the fact that they dropped everything to come and try to rescue as many people as possible. And then the the, the story kind of gets lost is that they, yeah. they faced all of those same dangers, and they could have succumbed to them too. But they were so they, they were trying so hard to be helpful. Um, which I think is, you know, maybe a, a good point to, to move on to um, the final topic of today's show, because we've been going for about yeah. an hour and a half now. <laughs> these conversations go so quick. That's why I, I love doing these interviews um, so funny. with you, because it's, it's not really an interview. It's like, you know, a no. full on conversation. Um, so do you want to go first for your, your logistics of story? Yes, I, I will. And uh, this actually is going to be on an upcoming episode of Point of Sales. So I'll dive into it just a little bit deeper. But uh, I always love when a company comes out and says, hey, logistics girlies. <laughs> that's going like, to be like the new thing. That's the episode title. <laughs> yeah, logistics girlies. Uh, I'm one of you and I'm a CEO of a company and we're short because of our supply chain. And that's I, I hate that sentence. Because my follow up question, and no one ever asks in these like things, which I get, uh, is okay. What part of it, you know? So, uh, Sriracha, it's the company that makes Sriracha. I think it's Hoi, uh, Hoi Young Food or, or Hoi Fung Foods. Uh, they came out and said, "Hey, 
sriracha were having trouble still. They came out, I think, last year that their supply chain had slowed down. Uh, they're having issues with their suppliers, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, and so they came out again. They didn't mention the suppliers. They just were like very brief and short about it and just said, hey, we're slow. It might be tough for you to find sriracha at your stores until about September in which, in which we should start having a come up. Now, again, I said bullshit why is this happening so start diving into it and it's very interesting so in 2019 prior to of course covid or anything uh hoi fung again is the sriracha producer they had one specific uh supplier just one supplier of all of the red uh jalapenos i believe that they need to uh have specifically to produce sriracha jalapenos it's a, I think peppers. Sorry, peppers. Hot red peppers. Okay, okay. So I was going to say jalapenos are green. Maybe that's a different sauce, or it maybe might it's just be, the chili. It might be the chili. I, I don't know the sauce. Uh, well, I don't. I don't know how the sauce is made. Quite <laughs> literally. Uh, so uh, the way that like they specifically made them though was like I had to sit after it was like picked for like a certain amount of time. Like it was. It had this whole like uh, special way that it was picked. Anyway, oh, it is so, red jalapeno. You're right. Oh, yes, yes. Th- yes. Thai chili peppers, red jalapeno, and serrano peppers yeah, are so in that sriracha re- sauce. That red jalapeno is kind of like the, the thing that makes it really sriracha. Mm. So the the company that uh, – or the farm that produced them was a group called – and you might know them more now because they actually make their own sriracha called Underwood Ranches. Mm. Now, in 2019 – Underwood started to understand. I'm mean, let's blame Hillary Clinton on this one. Maybe it will Beyonce. <laughs> uh, they started to understand that they were okay after 28 years of doing this and being their provider. Uh, well, how much money are you making off Sriracha, right? Like, are, are we really getting the piece that we should be getting? Hmm. And so the leadership over at Underwood started diving into like trying to figure out exactly what their finances were. Now, I think uh, Hoi Fung Foods, I'm probably saying Hoi wrong, uh, was nervous because likely they understood, well, if they find out what we're making, they might charge us more. We only have so much that we can give up, blah, blah, blah. So they were like, really, no, you can't see our finances. You can't see any of this. Uh, No broker transparency for them. No broker transparency (laughs) at all for them. Uh, and at the time, uh, there had over, I mean, this, this farm really was dedicated to them over 1700 acres. Oh, wow. Um, in 2016, they received more than $22 million in revenue just from Hoi Fung alone. And so they, they started getting upset because they wouldn't, they wouldn't open up, uh, their books to them. They wouldn't have open conversations with them. Apparently at the same exact time, the leadership at Hoi Fung was really nervous at the time of losing its biggest customer, Walmart. So on their side, they're like paranoid that, uh, maybe they're going to kind of undercut us or service someone else. And then we'll lose all of our, our money, et cetera. So they ended up uh, getting really nitpicky on rates, et cetera, and underpaid Underwood. I think it was $1.6 million for oh, wow. their services for you. Yeah. So Underwood said, screw you. We're tired of, we clearly realized that we're, we have power in this relationship. So they ended up going back and for all the in- inconvenience of not really creating this real open relationship, they ended up suing them. Uh, back uh, because without that 1.6 million it also cost their business and they ended up winning actually about 23 million dollars against Hoi Fung's food so wow. at first the Underwood was uh, in trouble they of course you're now missing out on 22 million dollars of a relationship they slowly brought that back and I think they said in 2020 is when they started to break back even but the problem with Hoi Fung is that they had nowhere to get these jalapenos now and had relied on such a strong i mean they're like within miles from each other so the it wasn't far from their 
uh, factories. It was like the perfect supplier relationship. They just burned it to the ground, basically. And to this day, they still are having problems trying to get their hands on these peppers. So, because wow. a lot of people are like, well, how come everyone else is doing Texas Pete isn't out? Everyone else is fine. Why is it Sriracha in particular having these issues? Well, they're dealing with a loss of a 20 almost 30 year relationship with a supplier hmm. and trying to continue to build that up and now it's so many people coming back to mexico which where a lot of their uh jalapenos are pulled now uh they're competing on a way bigger basis than they have so i think it's it's an interesting story of uh how important it is to build that good relationship right with your supplier and to also make sure that you're diversified for this exact reason because we're on year two or three now. It looks like that Sriracha hasn't been able to keep up with services. And it's interesting now Underwood has its own Sriracha now that people actually enjoy and, and like just as much. So um, and winner, it, winner, it, chicken dinner. Do you, the original creator of Sriracha, isn't he like a one man operation? Yeah, like, it, yeah, he it's like grew it up from his it's a, that's what I mean. I think it was a really a uh, fear of like losing that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if we share too much, there's a potential that someone could take what we've built. And, and that's exactly what's happening now. Yeah, literally, right? And now that's ex liter quite literally not you're only down $25 million. But I mean, the relationship itself was it worth that 25 mil? Was it worth the 1.6? You decided to hold back? And then also from this, the landscape of, I wonder if there are any like pepper cartels, you know how there's like avocado cartels and olive oil cartels um, mm -hmm. who control, you know, sort of the, the production and the manufacturing of those goods and who you can sell to and at what price. I wonder mm -hmm. if that's now playing a role too, where like maybe um, there's some kind of like pepper cartel that is preventing the original Sriracha brand from succeeding. So then that way, all of the maybe their competitors or maybe somebody that they're funding can succeed instead. Uh, most likely it's uh, it, it's really it's just interesting, I think. Uh, and also just the business dynamic relationship, right? It's like how many times it just reminds me of freight in particular where one thing goes wrong. Right. And like these shippers just want to like, we're never using you again. And it's like, really? Like you're you think you think you can just find capacity out of the blue uh so yeah you can't even uh, the largest most popular i'm a i'm more of a texas peak girl i'll say but uh <laughs> they can't uh sriracha can't even uh build that relationship up correctly yeah which is pretty crazy i mean i've heard you know for years that it's you know the sriracha shortages i always thought it was a marketing ploy and i'm like no they're you know it'll be back um and then i was curious as to how these other like a texas pete were coming out with their own version yep. of different srirachas and i'm like well how are they finding it but this other company can't and so um when i found out that sriracha because my boyfriend actually he loves sriracha so uh he was doing he was like where the hell you know he's trying to find yeah. out where the hell is going or what the hell's going on with all of this these products and so it, it forced him to kind of i guess learn about the owner and he's like oh it's a one-man op um so yep. i'll just i'll keep supporting him and you know just you know buy these other brands until he gets back up and running that's what his sort of an interpretation of it um but now you know come to find out it's maybe it's like a soured business relationship that's ending up it may be the i don't know it, it sounds like something that could be solved but it could also put you out of business pretty quickly yeah and it, it sounds like the part of it too is that the specific jalapeno like in the way that they have to like uh, grow it uh produce it uh is is very labor intensive right mm -hmm. so it's like it's not something that you can just like pick up and put somewhere else it's special yeah special care of the chilies requires renders them more valuable to extreme weather in extreme weather conditions such as uh droughts right which california is already experiencing or Colorado River's uh, depleted water supply. So you oh, add so. up all of that, and it's like, who else are you buying these from now? Right. It's, it's definitely weird. one of those situations, obviously, to you know keep an eye on. But I, it's it's really, I, you know, maybe I'll bring it up in a, in, a, in a future show. But the the pepper growing specialty that is involved in hot sauces is just getting more and more scientific. 
Yeah. I I love watch. So like for for example, I I went to uh, Belize a, a couple years ago, and they are known for their habanero peppers. And there's this company um called Marie Sharps, which you can now uh, get her hot sauce in um in WalMarts all across the country. Um, but she has the best hot sauce because she has the best peppers. And so she talked about, um, especially early on, because she's uh, Belize, like born and raised. Um, her family has lived on the same farm for generations, which I should probably, I'll just explain it now. Um, I was going to save it for a future like logistics of story. But uh, <laughs> she is, so she goes through like this entire process, family owned farm. Um, they grow all these peppers. They start making this hot sauce. So it's like a really proud like moment for Belize, which is, you know, compared to other countries, it's a smaller country. Um, they're in Central America and their farmland is so it's more pristine than the rest of like the caribbean or the these environments where um growing peppers is required because where they're positioned country-wise hurricanes miss them so they're able to grow much more frequently than other countries and so it's a little bit of um, a different pepper taste it's more flavorful um that comes from marie sharp's habanero peppers but because she grows them on her family farm then she's able to you know manufacture them all on site and then distribute from there she wanted to try to get into the united states in like the early 2000s, I believe. Um, so she was partnering with an American businessman who came down and wanted to invest and, um, you know, get all of the the needed supplies or the, the needed structure to help her expand. Well, she trusted him a little too much, but not enough to where she gave him the actual recipes of the hot sauces. Mm. Because, and thank God she did that because this American businessman found out about her entire operation and then just found another operation to source the peppers from in another area of the, the, the Caribbean and brought his hot sauces to market. And so if you see a logo of like almost like a Frida looking type, you know, Spanish woman on the label, that's the one that's the fraud. Don't get wow. that one. Get the Marie Sharps because she's the one that is her family or, you know, her family farm. It's her supply chain. She controls it. So, you know, hopefully she doesn't ever have to worry about um, the situation of what, you know, the Sriracha brand is facing right now. But um, she's definitely like a woman in manufacturing supply chain that I want to root for. I've tried to get her on the show, um, but she has an incredible operation uh going on in belize and now you know despite that what that american businessman did or tried to do to her she's now expanding out into um retail stores much more because i used to I just have to buy it from her website now i can go into a walmart and and get it now instead awesome and That's she's really cool. she's fantastic so um you know good little i guess side note story so you know we're kind of talking a little bit um about cargo crime which has become an obsession for me lately, which is why I did the story on the logistics of stolen sand in the last episode. You know, we're kind of talking about, you know, pepper cartels and things like that. There's one maybe future, maybe evolving cartel that is um, popping up nowadays, and that is the fruit roll-up cartel. Or maybe it's just Americans just ah. flying all over the globe trying to um, sell fruit roll-ups. It's this ice cream challenge one? Yes. Yeah, so with, with fruit roll-ups, for, for folks who, who may not remember, fruit roll-up is like that kind of fruit snack. It's rolled out into a roll, as the, the name implies. And you unroll it, and then you can kind of eat it in a variety of different ways. It's kind of like an airhead, kind of like taffy-type texture. Not really taffy. Um, but anyways, um, the tick, there's a TikTok challenge that has been going viral for you know several months. And it's been, essentially what you do is you unroll the fruit roll up, you take a scoop of ice cream, you put it in the middle, and then you fold the fruit roll up so it's almost like a, a sandwich. That ice cream makes the fruit roll up so cold that when you bite into it, it's almost like it's crunchy, it's crispy, yeah. like it just changes the, the texture of the fruit roll up itself. So because it's going so viral, it's creating this demand globally and to the point where like a normal fruit roll up box is what like you know 6.99 for you know a pack of like 12 of them well a couple of americans just got busted in israel by trying to smuggle fruit roll ups into the country into a suitcase they had 
600 of them, I want to say. Oh, my God. Six. Yeah. No, no, no. Not 600. 600 pounds of fruit roll-ups that were found in their suitcases. And if you know anything about cargo crime or, you know, you know, cross-border shipping or anything like that, you know that you cannot enter a country um, with a lot of merchandise with the intent a lot to sell. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> 600 pounds to be precise um in order to sell these things to um israelis where one fruit roll-up pack is going for anywhere from like eight dollars to fifteen dollars a piece so because they're <laughs> smuggling so many i mean think about the economics there like i gotta kind of gotta give it to them for trying because that's yeah. a, that's, a, that's a hustle mentality that's a hustle move you you buy a box of 12 of them for seven bucks and you flip them for you know that that same price for individually um so that is that is the 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 fruit roll-up um controversy that is going on which is uh it, it, I, I would play a little bit of a you want to see the clip I'll, I'll play the clip yeah I know you're, you're not on tiktok um i love so. this so they just like thought they could be like miles teller and war dogs and just bring in like <laughs> it's like do you, do, millions do you of know dollars? they have sophisticated technology designed to find drugs this, this seems like an idea that came up in a frat house like this sounds like a frat house idea guys <laughs> It's such an American we thing hit to a do, lick. I think, too. Like, let's yeah. take these snacks and flip them on the secondary like, market. Do they have someone buying or are they just about to, like, walk around? And <laughs> We heard you guys are buying this for the, for the high. Oh my All God. right, let me play this clip really quick. This looks like the guy who would do this. <laughs> <laughs> I love the graph. <laughs> that is it's it take is... said take them out of the box. Just <laughs> don't even bring the box in here, just like <laughs> <laughs> maybe they thought that they could maybe, you know, sell it a little bit more to airport security. But for folks who are not aware that Israel is probably the last place yeah. that you want to try to sneak products in and out of. Uh, they don't really even have um, a, like a ton of airport security, except for people who are trained to walk around and study body language. Like that's how they, they you know, they ha obviously have the big guns because, you know, the Israel, Palestine, which is. You know, whole other whole other topic that I don't know enough, uh, nearly enough to, Just to talk like about. Just shaking in their boots, like, oh, we got something big, <laughs> right. big, we got something big, guys. And they, <laughs> it's fruit rollups, roll suitcases and suitcases of fruit roll-ups, In case you were just listening and you, you didn't actually time? see the video, um, no reports yet on if they'll get jail time. They'll probably pay a, a fairly large fine. Um, and then that merchandise will be confiscated because you can only you're only allowed. This is my um, uh, to catch a smuggler knowledge, which is my favorite show um, that airs on National Geographic. You have to you're <laughs> only allowed a certain amount of a product to carry that's reasonable for personal um, usage. So, for example, like uh, what, what gets caught a lot on that show is cigarettes. So people who are, you know, buying the cheaper yeah. cigarettes, especially like in the States um, and then taking them like, you know, across seas or, you know, somewhere it's so you have to pay duty tax on those. You have to declare it, um, and then if you don't do both of those things, then you're 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 facing a lot of trouble, a lot of issues. Uh, you should not. Uh, maybe we'll talk about this on the next one too. You should check out the guy from Michigan who um, was the Pez dispenser like collector, and apparently because Pez dispenser, he used to go over to Europe where they made all the pezzes and he would get his hands on like the first editions that never went to market and he literally he did a fruit roll up <laughs> and he he stuffed he would just go over with suitcases stuff his bag full of them well customs caught him on coming back but someone at pez never put the pez product into the customs like Apparently, when you make a product you're, and you want it to follow those guidelines, you're supposed to register the product to Customs Border Patrol. Oh, wow, Patrol. that's interesting. And because it's like one suit at Pez never did the paperwork, 
they had to let him go. So he like he was like he's uh, it's a it's a Netflix documentary. It's very I interesting. Say, I, th- I thought I've heard of it before, but it might be one of those I just saw the preview and never actually click play. Yeah, no, he he started off as a box top dude, like scamming box tops, like uh, just like like he's the reason that the box tops now say only one per purchase, like. <laughs> <laughs> like, the hustle one, never stops <laughs> yeah and so then he he sniffed out Pez's and it's a very sweet film because the family still lives very poor in like a rural area in Michigan but he's got and he he does have a demise but it's like you get to meet the whole Pez uh, like group groupies and they all know about him and but it's that what I that's what I found the most interesting right being a logistics girly <laughs> is he, he gets he's like yeah they pull me up and they start going through the list of products that you can't bring in at that certain amount and Pez literally never did the paperwork wow and apparently so the because there's a U.S. Pez and then European Pez and the U.S. Pez guy like made him his like arch nemesis for like his whole life and then he got his hands the guy like got his hands on like the U.S. Pez's like favorite Pez ever made that like never went to market and he like found out about it and he like lost his shit. He's like, not this Pez guy again. <laughs> and so everyone it's should like go. like arch nemesis. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it's very crazy. I just, it, it was nothing I love more than billionaire men, <laughs> billionaire stepfathers and, and, and their challenges. But it was like, it's really interesting how like this dude just straight up drives to the Ukraine one day and it's like, hey, you got some Pez's? Like just sweet talks his way into getting like these Pez's that no one has ever scene or yeah it just becomes a like a millionaire off pezes so it's wow. insane so mm-hmm. he'll you know eventually i imagine a lot of those will end up in a museum um probably you know after What's, maybe is he still alive yeah he's still alive there and there's a uh, it he, like he's like a hero like people like love this dude and he stopped mm-hmm. doing it because um it was just like getting like too too dangerous if <laughs> i remember right you know, and, and and like uh there's like another character you meet too who like uh won't show you his collection like because he doesn't want people to know what he has and what because it could affect the price it's like oh yeah it's like you get really introduced to the world of peasants but that's the cool thing it's like oh wow like you could if, just imagine if fruit roll never <laughs> never like award israel yeah it's really cool it's really interesting so yeah go check that one out <laughs> all, all, all really great com- contributions to um, this week's episode. Before, um, I, I meant to bring this up ahead of time um, before we dived into a lot of these different topics. Um, but threads, we got that. We got some new uh, social oh, media shit. action going oh, on. God. <laughs> I did download app. it. <laughs> you did download. Okay, I so for folks yep. who, um, it, maybe if you're listening to this by the time that we're recording this on Thursday, July the sixth. And uh, Meta has launched, Meta, the parent company to Facebook, um, has launched a rival to Twitter called Threads. Zuckerberg, um, who is the CEO of Meta and uh, founder of Facebook, he has been rumored to be working on kind of a text-based social media platform for a while now. But Twitter had a bunch of drama over the last, I mean, what does Twitter not have drama? Um, But they had an extra drama when they introduce what's called a rate limit. So there's a, there's a couple factions in being uh, I- involved here where you have all of these AI platforms, these large language models who are data scraping places like Twitter, Reddit, um, Quora, you know, so these internet forums where the real value of that platform is in their data. And so you typically will have to license your data via API to allow for integrations into your platform. So Twitter decided to combat against these large language models, just straight up just scanning their data and stealing it without you know, paying Twitter. Um, they decided to introduce mm. what's called a rate limit, but they introduced these rate limits for everyone, um, including just regular users of the platform who do not frankly give a shit about anything else they just want to access the platform they they, if you put kind of like a warning in front of them that you can't browse anymore on their own platform they're going to find they're they're going to put their attention somewhere else so it was a very questionable move by elon to introduce this it feels like one of those things that sounded good in like maybe a meeting 
and then they yeah. rushed it to development and then the <laughs> users hated it. All of that to say, Mark Zuckerberg has now launched, pushed, probably pushed up the launch of what the platform is now called Threads and published it live yesterday. Overnight, it grew to 30 million users. Now, to put it in perspective, it took Facebook years what? to get to 30 million users. Um, they had 10 million in a matter of hours, which is it's something that I think, you know, like, uh, it's like I, I can't think of the, the numbers right off the top of my head. I'll, I'll pull them up in just a second. Um, but just the growth of the platform already, I can tell it was one of those moments I did join. I was on Instagram as I saw it. And it was uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's like, hey, listen, you know, this this <laughs> this platform is going off. He's like, I got a lot of faith in this. If you are working in some capacity of social media, he's like, this is what you do. You download the new apps, you give it a shot, you see, you roll the dice and you see if something will stick. Being an early adopter has a lot of advantages. And I said, damn it, Gary, I don't want another social media platform, but he's right. Let me just give it a shot. It was a very seamless download um, sign up process because you're essentially porting your username and your bio and all that stuff from Instagram immediately over to threads. The threads user experience is very clean. It looks just like Twitter. It's not just text. There is video and images. Um, so far the text seems to have the greatest importance as far as the algorithm is concerned. Um, you do, you can follow people. People can follow you. And then for your feed, it's just one choice. And they're kind of just, you know, throwing a, a bunch of accounts at you to see what you would like to engage with. So there's no like, um, th there's no additional timeline features just yet. Um, it still is not, even, it's maybe 24 hours old. Um, so I'm sure that they will introduce, you know, th those different features. They'll introduce advertising because it's Facebook for God's sakes. Um, they're going to have some kind of an advertising component to it. Um, but it does feel like in the sense of like striking while the iron is hot. And then also from the standpoint of like a Mark Zuckerberg type who separately from this is also going to be fighting Elon Musk in uh, the Roman Coliseum, which is another little sort of string to pull on with Jeez, this whole that's... story. So it's like Zuckerberg out of nowhere is fighting Elon on two different fronts and winning. And I mean, at least for now, obviously the platform is very young, um, but 30 million people making the process very seamless to where there are people that you already know and people that you don't know as soon as you sign up. So are you going to follow a lot of the same people that you followed on Instagram? Probably not because of the way that the feed is designed, which feels very much like uh, the TikTok for you page where for folks who don't know, you have a for you page that TikTok, you know, their algorithm is very good where they know what kind of content you want to see. And a lot of times, especially from the social media perspective in today's day and age, you have your platforms for connecting with people that you know, like Facebook for family and close friends, Instagram's kind of the same way. Um, but this one, it looks like they're taking the conscious choice of giving you the content that you want first not necessarily from the people that you connected with. So it's that different sort of TikTok mindset where we don't really care about who you're friends with. We wanna show you the content that's going to keep you there the longest. And when I tell you that it felt kind of special to be part of it last night, because there's no ads, there's none of like the scammy yeah. like course guys, the hustle bro guy, they're not there yet. They probably are there by today because there's 30 million people and, and growing. Um, but it, it was a very nice experience. And I don't know that I've had that experience on a social media. Like I, I'm, I'm, I've been twitching a little bit all day because I haven't checked the threads yet to see what's popping off. But it's a lot of the same content that works well on Twitter seems to work well on threads. Um, they seem to, from an algorithm standpoint, prioritize text over images and videos. I, I, I tried to bunch last night. I posted our logistics of sand videos and got crickets. Um, but I post, you know, a, a, you know, just a shit post like how I typically post on Twitter and it does, it does okay. Um, and okay in that respect is uh, I got six likes on a post and I was like, oh wow, I'm doing something right. <laughs> So it was one of those moments where like the, it, you have to challenge yourself to learn a new social media platform. And you have to kind of make those decisions on, is this gonna be worth my time or not? 
Um, but so far, so good. I, I, I think it's worth. Um, I, I think it's worth the time to at least try it and, and download it because the sign up process is so much easier. Um, I'm sure there's going to be improvements made to the platform. And I'm sure you know we'll, we'll see what those are. But so early signs are so far so good. It looks like you're you're trying it out. You know, as we see. So what are your what are your early thoughts? You're already sucked in. I was I was just about to, I was wondering if you could see me uh, like following you and everything on there. <laughs> It's just Twitter. Yeah, it, it, uh, the but icons like, look the same. Like it's very, very similar. But it's like cool because it also links. It's like now you have your wow, Zuckerberg, you, you fucking genius. Because <laughs> now it's like I can do if I click this. Does this take me to Instagram? Oh no! Oh, wow. Because <laughs> that's the annoying thing. To, oh, I bet you this is so much easier to post on both Threads and Instagram at the same time probably wow. not yet um there's also like a question around like dms because there's no dms on threads yet um so there's mm. kind of I, I saw one person kind of theorizing that they'll they'll just keep kind of like what facebook tried to force like messenger on everybody um i would assume that it would sync your dms though for both instagram and this you know what i mean I, you would point. think, but with those kind of capabilities, just, I mean, even like to this day, like Facebook and Instagram don't play nicely together. And I think it was only recently, like within the past couple of months that from like a social media manager standpoint, you couldn't even upload like a thumbnail to reels or schedule your reels, which is very important for, you know, a social media, you know, marketer or manager standpoint. Everyone is on this thing. It's so funny. <laughs> I'm like, what? Gerard's on here too. That's so funny. Wow. Yeah. So, um, a right, new, I'm a my new phone social down. media app for everybody to to try out. <laughs> I'm going on vacation this weekend, and so um, <laughs> I had a, a rule that I was like, no social media all weekend, and then I download this godforsaken app, and now I'm wondering, I'm like, when do I break my own rule that I created out of no one's um for wish or no one's uh I guess motivation. That's awesome. <laughs> Rick's emailing me now. Oh, <sighs> yeah. Well, great. yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, that, that everyone I... go to Threads and find me on Threads. <laughs> yes. If you're already friends with Blythe, I've retweeted her stuff. You know, it's oh, interesting. Yeah. You, can't, you can't see like who people are following, but you can only you can see you who's can. following them. So you you can. Um, oh, you so can? if you click on the person's profile, click on how many followers they have, it'll bring that up in a separate tab. Um, but it. It, it doesn't show you how many follow people you're following. Oh yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't do that, but it will show you. Yeah. Because, like, for example, I went into um, a couple different people that I admire. Like Craig is one of them. So I saw that Craig Fuller, you know, owner of Freight Waves, yep. a founder of Freight Waves. Um, so I went into his and I said, "Well, who is he following?" Because it's probably people I want to follow too. Um, so I did that with a, a handful of people to see. Um, you know, who I should be following on this account or on this platform. And I, I'm trying to be really, I guess, conscious of who I'm following as well. Like, I don't want to follow the same people that I follow on, you know, like Instagram or even Facebook. I, you know, with those platforms connected to this, I, I don't know that I want like the Instagram and the Facebook audience to see my shit posting yeah, capabilities I that I have honed in on Twitter for so long and they have yeah, no idea that exists. But now it's going to be shining a light on that <laughs> over in threads. So we'll, we'll roll the dice. That's what we do um, in marketing. We kind of see, you know, what platform is going to pop off or not. But there are advantages to being early adopters. Yeah, we'll see you all in threads. <laughs> That's a good way to end the discussion. So we'll see you all next time.